Good afternoon. My name is Bob Hauser, and I am the executive officer of the American Philosophical Society. Welcome to, to, to today's virtual discussion with Professor Annette Gordon-Reed on her wonderful new book on Juneteenth. I've read it, and I recommend it highly to all of you. This occasion is a special pleasure in light of the congressional and presidential actions that have made Juneteenth the 12th annual federal holiday and the only national holiday in the month of June. My personal hope is that that action will be followed by others that will secure voting rights and the equality, health, safety, and well being of all Americans. The American Philosophical Society resides in Lenape Hoking, the homeland of the Lenape people whose historical relationships with the land continue to this day. The APS acknowledges with respect their continued presence and perseverance and expresses its sincere thanks for the past and ongoing generosity of numerous indigenous communities and individuals who have offered their guidance, expertise, and opportunities for collaboration. We honor the Lenape community and those of other native peoples through our collections, fellowships, research awards, and engagement activities. In fact, I'm pleased to report that just this week, the Mellon Foundation has awarded the society a five-year renewal of its support for our Native American Scholars Initiative. For those joining us for the first time, the American Philosophical Society was founded by Benjamin Franklin in 1743. The society is a catalyst for the discovery of new knowledge. Election to membership honors those who have made exceptionally significant contributions to science, the arts and humanities, and public life. The society promotes research by providing over one and a half million dollars in research grants and fellowships each year primarily to the younger scholars who need the support the most. Our library and museum collections and research centers serve scholars and visitors from across the globe. Please check our website, www.amphilsoc.org, to learn more about what we do and for news of forthcoming events. While some of our facilities will remain closed, the museum exhibition Benjamin Franklin Citizen Scientist, originally scheduled to open in April 2020, will in fact open to the public on the last weekend in July. Given the topic of this afternoon's discussion, I think it is especially important to note the shameful history of the society with respect to issues of racism and inequality. Most of our nation's founders were early members of the society. The APS had Thomas Jefferson as its president for 17 years, during most of which time he was either vice president or president of the United States. While we at the society continue to admire Franklin and Jefferson and other founding members for their key roles in the formation of our nation, for their leadership of the society, and for their devotion to science, education, and other noble causes, we are also much aware of their faults, most significantly their slaveholding. In more recent centuries, some APS members were leaders in the invention of so-called scientific racism and in the eugenics movement. Now, we at the APS are committed to sustaining the better parts of our institutional legacy while working towards a future of inclusion, diversity, equity, and access. That's the APS idea. We are using Zoom webinar for today's discussion, so don't worry, you've been muted. If you have a question, please use the Q&A button at the bottom center of your navigation bar. You can type your question in there at any time, and there will be time at the end of the conversation for questions. We also offer closed captioning for today's virtual discussion. If you would like to use it during the, pan during the discussion, please click on the CC box on the bottom navigation bar of Zoom. It's to the right of the Q&A button. Our guest today is Annette Gordon-Reed, 
the Carl M. Loeb University Professor at Harvard University. Among many other works, Professor Gordon Reed is the author of the Pulitzer Prize winning The Hemingses of Monticello, An American Family. She was elected to membership in the American Phil Philosophical Society in 2019. With that, I am pleased to turn the discussion over to Dr. Gordon Reed, uh, who will be in conversation with Dr. Patrick Sparrow, librarian and director of the Society's Library and Museum. Dr. Sparrow too is an historian and his work focuses on the era of the American Revolution. Professor Gordon Reed, Dr. Sparrow, the floor is yours. Thank you, Bob. And Thank you, Annette, for finding time to, to speak to us. I know how busy your schedule has been, but I can't tell you how much of an honor and a privilege it is to be able to converse with you. I, I first encountered you, Annette, um, through your publications, through your scholarship. Uh, as a graduate student, I read um, Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemings in American Controversy, and it really um, opened my eyes to the biases that are embedded in a lot of historians' work historically and the misinterpretations of evidence that have happened for decades and centuries and um, uh, how much there is left to be discovered or in some cases rediscovered in the past. Um, but just uh, really, um, it's, it's an incredible honor to be here to talk about your new book on Juneteenth. Mm -hmm. um, and this is how you describe the book uh, for our viewers who are tuning in. Um, it's a look at history through the medium of a personal memoir, a Texan's view of the long road to Juneteenth, the events surrounding the date itself and what happened afterwards and how all this shaped life in Texas, my family's life, and my own. Um, it is a fascinating work. It is so compelling. It's been on the New York Times bestseller list for, for now two weeks, and I'm sure for a lot longer. Um, so I want to start things off, though, by talking about Juneteenth. Um, for our viewers, some of whom maybe are just learning about Juneteenth uh, and this new federal holiday. So what, what is Juneteenth? Mm -hmm. Well, Juneteenth is a, a a phrase that commemorates, a word that commemorates June 19th, 1865, when Gordon Granger, United States Army General Gordon Granger, comes to Galveston, Texas to take over Texas uh, and take control of Texas. And he says, while he's there, he issues a general order number three that says that slavery is now over in Texas. And he was able to do this because the army of the Trans-Mississippi in the Southwest had surrendered at the beginning of June. Many people think that the Civil War, all of the fighting ended when Lee surrendered at Appomattox. But the army in the South, Southwest kept fighting. And in fact, they won the last battle uh, of the Civil War, but they realized that there was no place for them to go, that there was no way for them to win. And they surrendered at the beginning of June. And that's when Granger can go in and talk and make this pronouncement and say that slavery is over. Lots of times it's portrayed as if this was a secret. The Emancipation Proclamation was a secret and no one knew in Texas that it existed or that in, enslaved people. There's no reason to think that some of them didn't know that, um, that the Emancipation Proclamation had been issued. It's just that it couldn't go into effect uh, because they were still fighting. Uh, the United States had not taken control of, of that area. And so when Granger does this, there's great joy, as you can imagine, but there's also, there are also expressions of hostility towards the people who had, were enslaving people and also among whites who felt that they were part of a hierarchy that was being destroyed because of this. And there are instances of people who were celebrating that they were whipped for doing so. So this is a day that, but they kept celebrating. <laughs> you know, that's the important part. They kept doing this. And for the past 156 years, Texans, Black Texans have celebrated Juneteenth. And then 1980, it became a state holiday in Texas and everybody celebrates uh, Juneteenth. Uh, and so that's the, the story. It's the story of, how slavery ended in Texas, how the result of the final surrender of the Confederate army in that area. And when the United States takes control and brings Texas essentially, the idea is to bring Texas, preparing to bring it back into the union. And so 
even though it's something that happens in Texas, it's something that applied or affected the United States as a whole and the world. I think, you know, the end of slavery anywhere, emancipation anywhere is a marked advance in civilization and it has world, it has the implications for human rights all over the world, I think. Thanks. Um, so as you describe your book, it's, it's also a personal memoir. Um, mm -hmm. I didn't know if you could talk a little bit about what Juneteenth meant to you as a child growing up in Texas and now as an adult, um, thinking about Juneteenth as, as a federal holiday, but also looking back on your youth. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, uh, as a kid, it was a fun day. <laughs> it was a day for, I say in the book, it was a day for excess. We drank Soap, soda water, uh, we call it well, soda pop is what uh, people in other uh, part of the, the country would call it. But throwing firecrackers, barbecue, it was sort of like the 4th of July for black people, a very personal day and a day when adults got together, um, you know, visited people's homes, you, my cousins were around, everybody. It was a fun day and we really look forward to it. Um, now it means, I mean, I live in Manhattan now, so I, I don't barbecue. I have an apartment. I don't, we, we live in an apartment. I can't do that. But I still try to drink the signature red drink. Um, it's soda water now. I, I've read that in the 19th century, the, the red drink was hibiscus tea. Um, and that's what people started with. But red, and there's some questions about why red is important. Some people have a drink. Uh, some is red velvet cake strawberry pie. Red is a motif. Red figures throughout this. And I've heard a couple of explanations. One, and you'll appreciate this as a historian, how different things get grafted on <laughs> to stories. You, you don't know whether or not it's, uh, it's real or whether it's some, a modern incarnation, modern, modern addition to the story, uh, that it, red signifies the blood of, of people who suffered in slavery. Others say that it's an African, it's a holdover because in parts of West Africa, red has special significance. And so they're not wondering if this is not something, a continuation, something that was handed down. But for whatever reason, red food items are important in, in uh, Juneteenth. And so I will probably be doing that this uh, Saturday, find some barbecue somewhere, barbecue brisket, because I'm from Texas until we do beef as well. Um, and have some red drink and be with my family. Cause it's, it's a really, I mean, family is at the essence of the holiday. It's a time for people to gather together. And I also, I don't wonder if that's not because of the trauma in slavery of separation of families, why there's not a, a, um, a de desire to have holidays and moments, reunions where people all come together. But that's, that's at the heart of, of the holiday. And I hope to be able to do that this Saturday. Um, so in 1980, when Texas uh, took what was a um, private holiday that primarily Black Texans celebrated and made it a statewide holiday, did that change um, Juneteenth and at all? Um, how did that, how does Texas as a whole now celebrate this holiday? And how do you think that might portend for our new national holiday? Well, it certainly made, I think it made the celebrations more widespread, larger, because once it becomes a state holiday, there are other entities who can get involved and in, who have money, who have uh, you know, the capacity to put on shows, all kinds of things. It, it, it became, I think, an even bigger deal. Before it, you know, I didn't, uh, someone asked me, is this something that we learned about in our classes? And I don't think we talked about it in our classes. This was strictly, this was a holiday that black people carried forward. Um, over the years. But once it became a state holiday, then there's more, it just became more elaborate and um, more people are participating. It's not just black people, but white people. And I think that will continue as a national holiday. People will, will come up with new traditions. We'll keep the old traditions, I think, but come up with new things that uh, are you know, more connected to today, more things that will uh, attract young people and I just have a feeling that it will be, you know, it, it, it will continue as, I hope it will continue as, as a family day too, a time for people to get together with loved ones. That's great. I just wanna take a moment to encourage all of our audience. We have over 200 people uh, zooming in right now to ask us any questions you want using the Q and A function. Uh, we're happy to 
uh, exp expand this conversation to the audience as well with uh, Professor Gordon Reed. Um, so Annette, I want to ask you a little bit more about, about the, the book um, and the way that you deal with history. Um, you talk about the Texification of the United States. And, and when I read the books, I often felt like you were talking about Texas's history, but in many ways, um, you're also talking about US history. And one of the things that you mentioned is that one of the problems you think about when people think about Texas history is a, uh, a, you know, an improper interpretation of its foundational moments uh, or its foundational moment. Mm -hmm. um, and you really take on, I think, the, the Alamo, which for many people is that moment. And, also really dissect the constitution that Texas wrote, which for me um, made explicit um, so much that was implicit at the, the founding of the nation itself, the United States. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, I mean, reading some of those texts, it was just, it was you know, chocolate and chilling. And I didn't know if you could talk a little bit more about the constitution and also the ways in which you interpreted the Alamo in the book. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, Texans grow up with uh, the Alamo as a as a sort of a site of resistance, a site of great pride, uh, a site of stubbornness, people holding their ground for their principles. But the difficulty is, and I say in the book, is that you have to examine what some of those principles were. They were the Texians, as they were called, were fighting for a republic, and the republic they created was one that recognized, explicitly recognized slavery. And I'm glad you, you make this comparison to the United States Constitution that you know, people argue about whether or not it's a slaveholders union uh, 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 document or not. Um, but the United States Constitution refers to persons held to service. There's no explicit you know, statements about black people and what they can and can't do. Uh, the Texas Constitution, the Constitution of the Republic of Texas, is explicit in its protection of slavery. It's explicit in its statement that people of African descent can't be citizens. It's explicit in the, you know, the statement that Black people are not to be allowed to migrate to Texas without permission and, and reside there without permission. So it's it's a very very as you said, it's an explicit document, and it, it, it's a document that's about white supremacy, essentially, which makes me wonder how all of these sort of moves to um, sort of play down race and issues of race in history and in schools, how that could take place. There's no way to talk about the history of the Texas Republic without talking about race, because it's right there in the document. And you can't get around it. People, as you well know, people in the 18th and the 19th century talked about race. I mean, people act as if this is something that's a politically correct thing that we're just now making up and, and, and harping on. But it's always been a, a focus. It's always been talked about. And so that causes a, a problem, you know, looking back to the Alamo, for someone like me, a, a Black Texan, who you know, sort of grew up thinking about the Alamo in heroic terms. And then you find out that, you know, the major figures in there that we, whom we, we admire, are supposed to admire, were slaveholders themselves. And you understand that the conflict between Texas and Mexico, one of the central conflicts was over the question of slavery. Um, the, um, um, you know, Mexicans, uh, were anti-slavery. I mean, in the sense they outlawed slavery. Uh, they looked the other way in their province, um, you, know, te you know, Texas, because they wanted the settlers there to, you know, to sort of serve as um, bulwark against Comanche. I mean, so they, so they kind of looked the other way, but the Texians were always insecure about Mexico and whether or not they would move against slavery, the institution. So what do you do with this? How do you have this, how do you maintain this heroic vision, 100% heroic vision of these people when you realize what principles they were fighting for? And, you know, it's, there's a pitch battle going on right now down in Texas about what you can say at the Alamo, what docents and people are supposed to say at the Alamo. Uh, there are people who want them not to talk about slavery because they think it will make the Texans look bad, but, but what do you do with that? I mean, it's just an interesting idea that you hide things so that people will think well of folks instead of 
asking them to grapple with the complexity of this, of, of this situation and complexity of our feelings about this situation, I should say. Admiration for people who um, stood up for their principles, but also disdain for the principles they, for which they were standing up. It's, it's, um, it's, a, it's complicated business and I can understand, even though I don't, I don't agree with it, um, but people want to run away from that. That seems the safer thing to do. It's just not talk about it. And one of the other, uh, you know, foundational moments that you talk about is is the uh, uh, is, is slavery in Texas um, mm -hmm. and putting it in uh, a conversation with Jamestown in 1619. And mm -hmm. um, you make the point that taking a global perspective on um, slavery and the various systems that went into it. Um, provides a more complicated, um, I think, and complete um, a picture of, uh, you know, the origin stories of African Americans in North America. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yes, I mean, I, you know, I think if you, and I say this, if you ask most people when the first Africans came to the Americas, or, or certainly North America, they would say, um, in Jamestown, in 1619, that's when the first Africans are here. Now we know that there were Africans in that area apparently b before, a few years before then, but that's the iconic moment of you know, first contact. Uh, but um, we know that people of African descent came to the Americas and North America with the Spanish, Spanish explorers. And I talk about a man named Estebanico. Um, I knew him as Esteban, when I was a kid in Texas history class, he was mentioned in passing, but not really in depth. So I knew that he, he is the considered the first black person, a person of African descent of name that we know who was in Texas. He was enslaved by one of the Spanish. Uh, he comes on this expedition that's 300 people, almost 300 people that dwindles down to about four. And he's one of the four survivors and they, he and Cabeza de Vaca, whom I'm sure lots of people have heard, embark upon this trek. After they're enslaved by Indians for a time, they, they go across Texas and walk across Texas, parts of Texas and Mexico and end up on the Pacific seaboard. And there's this epic journey that Cabeza de Vaca describes in a, in a memoir that many people read. While he's doing this, Estebanico is sometimes serves as an as a translator among the native groups and the Europeans. And I just speculate, I wonder about what it would, what difference it would have made if we had an image of first black people in Texas way before Jamestown, mm -hmm. who were doing things other than working on a plantation, who are resourceful people and people upon whom uh, others relied. Would that change the narrative about African Americans that's sort of limited, you know, plantation slavery. Um, you, you're in the house. You're enslaved in the house or plant, or in the fields, and there are people who, do, as you know too, there are black people who are doing not just in the Spanish context, but who are doing all kinds of things that uh, during that time period. They're all over the world doing all kinds of things, and I think that would be important for people to know rather than just. You know, they came to the, the Americas and became, you know, plantation slave workers. So th those people have to be talked about as well. But I, I'm thinking of sort of broadening our understanding of an origin story that doesn't center and doesn't privilege English people and English speakers and Jamestown over other, uh, uh, you know, colonies, other places where Black people, that had Black people, who were in basically had a lot in common with their English, uh, you know, cousins who had been enslaved. They were living under the doctrine of white supremacy and they were living under slavery. So it doesn't make any sense to say that they have nothing in common just because they're speaking different languages. They had lots in common. And I, I want people to think of that as they're thinking about origin stories uh, in, of, of African-Americans in the United States. And you also talk about indigenous peoples in Texas and your own kind of um, growth in terms of thinking about and being aware of the indigenous histories. Um, if I remember right, you talk about your father uh, who always seemed to be on the side of the Indians in the Western uh, movies and shows you all would watch. Uh, and then you know, as an adult, um, as you, you know, read more, um, realizing that 
some Native Americans were involved in enslaving um, African Americans, uh, but that also gave you a new perspective on indigenous histories. And I don't know if you could tell us a little bit more about what you thought. Well, it's all just much more complicated than I had thought here. I mean, I, my father and I would have thought that there was sort of a natural affinity, necessarily a natural affinity um, between uh, African peoples and native peoples because they were facing, you know, quite frankly, a common foe. Uh, whites who were enslaving uh, African people of African origin and whites who were in conflict with Native Americans over land that they wanted to, to settle on and they wanted to take. So it would make sense that these two people thought of things in the same way, but that's because I was grafting our, our sort of present day understandings about race onto these people and not realizing that they had their own categories they had their own imperatives, they had their own agendas. Mm -hmm. And what a historian is, what, this is what I'm, a, 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 you know, a, as a civilian, as a, as, a, as a citizen, and so if we're thinking about these things as a teenager and as a young adult, um, that's the attitude I had. But as a historian, I understand that you have to, I do know that their categories aren't our categories, that they had their own lives. And part of what a historian is trying to do is to illuminate that. It's not about taking these people and using them to tell a story that you've already cooked up, <laughs> that you want it to be. It's about trying to figure out what they were doing. There's no, I, you know, it's a waste of time to go to the archive if you're not going to let yourself be influenced by it, <laughs> influenced by it, or sort of take what you're finding to, to, um, you know, to craft a way of telling the story of these people in the past. And they just wouldn't have had the kind of same racial sensibilities that I had. They wouldn't have thought of, uh, of a natural alliance. I mean, some of them did in fact cooperate, but that's, that probably is not on a, not, not on a racial basis necessarily. There's just the circumstances of that particular moment in that particular place made that the thing to do. And other places it did not. And uh, indeed, as you know, as I've said, uh, there were na some native peoples who held uh, people of African descent as slaves. So that complicates the narrative quite a bit. And just as we are having a reckoning of race, we say the country is supposed to be talking about this now. I, I've read that uh, even among native peoples that um, of between blacks who had been part enslaved in the tribe, sometimes their blood relations with these people. Uh, they are now having some sort of a reckoning of their own at this point about, about those days. So, you know, I, I, I love the end of your book where after documenting all this history, coming at it as a Texan, um, you ultimately say that, uh, uh, you know, Love, and here you're talking about love of Texas, does not require taking an uncritical stance toward the object of one's affection. In truth, it often requires the opposite. We can't be of real service to the hopes we have for places and people, ourselves included, without a clear-eyed assessment of their and our strengths and weaknesses. Mm -hmm. That often demands a willingness to be critical, sometimes deeply so. How that is, how that is done matters, of course. Striking the right balance can be exceedingly hard. I hope I've achieved the proper equilibrium. So can you tell us a little bit more about how you feel about Texas today? Well, I mean, I have, I love Texas. I always like going down there. I could live in Texas. My husband, who is not a Texan, who's a Californian, who I've, I brought to New York, supposedly for a couple of years, and that was a few decades ago, uh, would not live in Texas. Um, but I could easily live in Houston. I, I like Houston a lot, and I like Austin as well. Um, you know, I, it's, it's a place that I love because of the experiences that I had there with my family, uh, formative experiences that I had with my mother and my father uh, and my family, my extended family, friends. I mean, the associations that I have are with those moments, with those times that were happy. I mean, even though I'm describing a place that was very difficult in lots of ways, I would say that my childhood was happy. And it could be that if you're happy in the place where you're growing up, you retain affection for the place. And it's not just tied up in, it is tied up in the people, but it's tied up in the land. It's tied up in the, the look of things, the, the weather, all of those things that come together 
to form you help inform how you're experiencing things. And so I maintain that affection, even though I know that there are a lot of problems with the state. And I've often said, I, I can't see allowing the fact that there are some people in the state who don't like me because of my race, um, that they, that their dislike helps me, helps define Texas, because I don't think that they own Texas uh, any more than I do. And I'm, this is a family, my, my, my mother's family goes back in Texas, at least until the 1820s. And um, my father's side, probably the 1860s, if not before, and everybody, most of my family's still there. We're not a family that went out into the diaspora, the black diaspora, you know, people who, that Isabel Wilkerson talks about um, in, in um, the warmth of, of another sun, moving from the South to the North. When my relatives moved out of their country towns off the farms, they moved to Houston or they moved to Dallas or they moved to Austin. Um, you know, I'm the sort of odd person out who, you know, went to call, went off to college in New England. And so most of my family's there. I don't have, you know, large numbers of relatives all over the, the country as some people do, because everybody is pretty much there in Texas. So if you have that kind of association and with association with people who are still there, I maintain that sense of affection born of those kinds of connections in that particular place. And again, the fact that other people try to make it difficult for me or us or don't like us because of our race is that's that's on them but they don't own texas and you know i any more than i do and so you know it is what it is as they say yes, um so i, I we've got a, some questions coming in i want to turn uh, to them now um and the first question uh is uh, from our society's president in the greenhouse, uh, which is um, kind of following up on, on, on this question. And it's, um, your book is in some way, uh, she writes, uh, your book is in some way a love letter to your home state. I'd be interested in your reflections on today's Texas, uh, which seems to be a leader in repressive public policies. Mm -hmm. um, is there any hope for Texas and how might it change? So how could you see Texas changing? Well, you know, there, always, there was always the liberal strain a democratic strain in Texas, Ralph Yarbrough, other people. I mean, the, you know, Molly Ivins, you think of that kind of Texan, a white Texan. I mean, of course, black Texans have always been progressive because they've always been interested in changing their lives and making things better for themselves and better for the state as a whole. You know, it's a tough time. It, it's a lot, it's, you know, I spent a lot of my time explaining Texas to people because things that are happening there now, I was reading somewhere the other day that said that legislation that is being offered now and accepted now, when people tried to do that even like 15 or 20 years ago, maybe not even that long ago, would, would have gone nowhere. Um, I, when I grew up, I think I saw the a concept Confederate flag only rarely in Texas. It was mainly the United States, flag, the flag in the United States or the Texas flag, obviously. Um, a few years a few years ago, I was down there, and I happened to be on a sort of riding in the countryside, riding around in Texas, and I saw more Confederate flags than I had ever seen in Texas. The story about Texas when I was growing up was Texas, you know, the Lone Star State, and that's the flag. That's the flag that mattered. The Confederacy was there certainly, but that wasn't that wasn't pushed. In, in the same way as it is now. So this is, a, this is a puzzling time and it's a concerning time because, you know, a lot of things that are taking place down there that are inexplicable, the, the you know, the, the move to stop teaching about, about race in class and critical, critical legal studies, uh, critical legal theory, which probably is, I cannot imagine really is being taught K through 12 uh, in, in Texas, um, it looked, things could look bleak, but I do know I was remarkably heartened by the number of people who participated in the last election. Uh, they were out in full force trying to do the very best they could do. They didn't flip the state, but I think that genie is not gonna get put back in the bottle. People are going to want 
they know now that voting, seen in other parts of the country, Georgia, for example, voting makes a difference. And it's gonna be a pitched battle over this question of voting rights. But I'm, I, as I said, I'm heartened by the fact that people are motivated. People in Texas are motivated. And so I, I think there is hope for it. There is hope. It's, it's right now, it doesn't seem like it because they're just between the grid, <laughs> the grid in the winter, and now the grid in the, the summer, which is not gonna be funny if this, is, well, it wasn't funny to begin with. People died in, in the winter time too, but you know, it's, it could be disastrous uh, if things aren't brought under control uh, in the summer in Texas. So even though things look bleak, I'm going to opt for saying that I think that the enthusiasm that I saw, the energy that I saw people bringing to bear uh, in the last election, the fervor, the organizing, uh, I think that there is there's hope for the future. Yes, we got a lot of more questions coming in. Um, I, there's a nice follow-up from uh, Lasana Kazembe, um, and uh, they write, thank you for your wonderful, wonderful scholarship. Please share your ideas about how K-12 teachers might be able to integrate Juneteenth history into their teaching. Mm -hmm. Well, one thing about Juneteenth, by the, you know, we didn't talk about it in school and we didn't get, have a chance to um, celebrate it in school because we were out of school by Juneteenth. But I think there are so many uh, books that have been written now about Juneteenth that I've come into contact with since I've been doing this, you know, talking about this book and so forth of all ages. So some of those books would be helpful to people. I know um, uh, the Gilder Lehrman Institute has resources about slavery, about issues of slavery and emancipation as well. Uh, and they have a lot of things, materials for teachers that you might want to sign on to their site. If you just Google it, it will come up um, that could be helpful to you as well. I think reading material is really important. And there's so much age appropriate um, material out there that I think that teachers could easily find ways to, to incorporate this, this day and, and the, the issues that it raised in their classrooms. And another question from Margaret uh, Gammy. Uh, I'm curious what celebrations were like when slavery ended in other states? Were there similar holidays, commemorations outside of Texas? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I'm told that they celebrate April 3rd in Virginia. I think it's April 3rd, um, with the fall of Richmond. Uh, I was reading the other day that there's a day in uh, Florida, in, in St. Augustine, that people celebrate. I, I, this is the wonderful thing about about um, uh, Juneteenth as a holiday, I, I meant, you know, it's emancipation was a process over time. The Emancipation Proclamation, yeah, the Fall of Richmond, you can listen to lots of different things where pockets and groups of Black people were, uh, you know, achieved emancipation. And this is a day, it can be a day, I hope it's the day when people talk about all of those things, about African American people on their own running away from plantations, emancipating themselves by leaving uh, plantations. And so Juneteenth, I would hope, would not only be about that day, but we would talk about, that's a good point, we would talk about the other days that people have that are sort of pivotal points for them in, the, in this process of, of, um, of emancipation. Uh, Alyssa Warwick has a, 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 almost a natural follow-up question to that, which is, how do you think a national holiday of Juneteenth will impact local emancipation and freedom celebrations? And so in some ways, is this Texification that you write about in your book perhaps gonna intrude on what had been a lot of other local celebrations that were happening? Well, it could, but it, I mean, you know, well, I'm not a person who's given to, well, there's always something to do. You know, there's always a, there's always a way to solve problems. The, the way to solve that problem is to talk about Juneteenth, as I was saying before, bring the sort of local things into talking about Juneteenth. I mean, the, the date has taken over because, largely because of, of the, um, the actions of Texas and the Texans who have left the state have sort of brought this, the idea, brought the holiday into other states. And because we, you know, Black Texans were so tenacious in keeping this going every year and creating a, a, a space for it, 
you know, and, and, and sort of predictable space for it o- over the years, you know, it has come to be, it, it, that's why it ends up being the sort of marker of notions of emancipation. But I, I don't think we should leave these other things out as well. We should talk about all of them, the 13th Amendment, obviously, um, Emancipation Proclamation, you know, Fall of Richmond Day, whatever the local celebrations are, you can talk about them. It doesn't, it doesn't, there's nothing that's written here that because Juneteenth is the national holiday that we must not talk, we will cease to talk about these other places. I think that's more of an occasion to, to talk about these other places that have their own uh, understandings about emancipation and add it to it, add to the mix. It doesn't have to, it's not either or. Next, um, another question, uh, somebody who must have seen your Twitter feed uh, wants to know what the mood was like in the White House yesterday. It was intensely happy mood. People were laughing and smiling and, and talking, people that you would, I, you, know, you would not think of as having much in common. I saw Congress people who would be natural enemies <laughs> in, in a political sense. Uh, talking to and laughing with one another, you know, standing close, close talking and seeming to relevant to sort of revel in uh, the good feelings of, of the moment. So it was, it was a, it was an ecstatic time. And, you know, just with lots of, just lots of happiness and joy that this day had come to pass. Um, so I, I want to turn um, back to the memoir aspect of, of this book again and ask you something that I've often wondered. Um, and, uh, you know, it, one of your sentences really brought it out to me, which is, um, it is possible, very likely, actually, that my time in Texas prepared me for the work I do as a historian of the early American Republic. Mm-hmm. Um, so I was wondering, you know, when you entered law school, Harvard Law after Dartmouth, mm-hmm. um, what did you anticipate your career being 20, 30 years down the road? And when did becoming a historian specializing in Jefferson and in the Republic come into being and how? Well, when I entered law school and when I graduated from law school, I went to work for a law firm. I didn't think that I would be doing that forever, but I did think that I probably would be a lawyer um, forever. And I had in mind being a lawyer with the possibility of maybe writing things on the side you know, which is hard to do <laughs> if you're certainly it's impossible, near impossible to do if you're a young associate at a law firm to spend the time that you need to write other things and do your billable hours. Um, so I thought that I might end up as a government attorney working in government, some sort of what I would say a do-gooder organization, the gov- you know, arm of the government that I that I would feel affinity for. And that's what I thought I, I would be doing. Um, how it came about is that after I left practice and, you know, after I tried doing this writing business on the side, I realized that you can't have the kind of concentration and the, the uh, bring to the job of practicing law, what you need to, if you're trying to be a serious writer at the same time. And I'd written a number of things, gotten some rejections, you know, and, I realized that I wanted to try to write full time. And that's how I ended up going into academe because presumably that's what you're supposed to be doing is writing. And when I got into, uh, I thought about going to get a PhD in history and I looked at Columbia and I realized and I discovered that it's almost like seven years or whatever to completion. And I thought to myself, you know, I don't wanna do that. I don't, I'm, I'm at a stage in life now. I've already been to law school. I was married um, at this point, um, and you know, I thought I, I don't really want to do that. And so, and I, you know, by then, when I was thinking of this, I already had a child and another one on the way. It just didn't seem practical for me. And so I worked. I went to work at a at, at a law school where they let me write what I wanted to write and let me do what I wanted to do. And I wrote my first book. Uh, Thomas Jefferson, Sally Hemings, an American controversy. And from there, you know, things open up. And from there, I ended up uh, with an appointment uh, at Rutgers in the history department, stayed at New York Law School as, you know, as a sort of a dual 
um, you know, dual appointment. And then I wrote the Hemings as a Monticello. And after that, that's how I ended up coming to Harvard. Um, and so it, it's not a people, when people ask me for advice, it's not a path that I can say, <laughs> you know, do this because it's so like not conventional, uh, my way to where, where I am, wherever that is, um, was not predictable. And I, I couldn't have foreseen that this would happen this way um, because I can't, you know, could not foresee the twists and turns and the opportunities that I was given by people in the historical profession who championed my work, you know, Peter Onuf, Jan Lewis, uh, liked the book and pretty much introduced me to the history profession, historians within the profession, and things went from there. I often tell people when they're starting out in a career that, you know, no career is really a linear path. And people are really hoping that they can have something set, but it, it really does take a lot of yeah. different turns. Yeah. So what, what, what drew you to, um, to write this book when you did, Juneteenth? Well, it was during the pandemic. I had written an essay for The New Yorker uh, about Juneteenth. And the year before that, I had written uh, a review for The New York Review of Books of five books about Texas. So Texas was kind of on my mind, had been on my mind. My editor has been asking me for a number of years to write a book about Texas. We were thinking of a bigger book than this. But when I was at home, uh, Harvard had gone virtual. I, I commute between New York and Cambridge. And since Harvard was online, I might as well be online at home in New York with my husband. So I was there with a lot of time on my hands after school was out. Uh, I got the, I was thinking, and I was also thinking about my parents. I mean, the pandemic with the intimations of mortality around you all the time. You know, I'd go, we'd go out to Central Park and see the tents in the, the park from the overflow from COVID patients. Um, the, you know, Manhattan was ground zero for all of this. And so it was a very, very intense time. And so it made me think about my parents and I missed them. And I wanted to be able to write about them actually. And so that was a real impetus to try to get in touch, writing about the family, writing about them um, was sort of a, a therapeutic thing. It was, it was a helpful thing for me to do. And so this was sort of my pandemic uh, project. Yeah. Uh, and uh, yeah. Great. Uh, um, pardon me? Go oh, ahead. Uh, and just uh, your, um, your comment about the Confederate flags elicited a lot of comments. Um, uh, some questions, but a lot of comments about you know, people around the country commenting how they've all seen Confederate flags, the number of them increasing in time. And some people wondering about the nationalization of Juneteenth. and. Mm -hmm how this is going to, this rise in the, um, you know, the, the uh, you know, popularity of Confederate flags alongside now this national holiday to celebrate emancipation. Is this an opportunity for greater, to, you know, to encourage greater diversity inclusivity? Is it, you foresee, you know, any problems? Um, there, there's a lot of questions along those lines. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, it's, we're, at, we're sort of a strange moment in the country when people, there are, seemingly a significant, well, I don't know if it's significant, but a good number of, of, of people who are not so sure about the American Republic, about the American nation. And that surprised me. I, I say, you know, um, I mean, I knew about the, I mean, I knew that there were Confederates and that the sort of lost cause mythology, lost cause uh, atmosphere, those kinds of things have always been present. But this is something different. I mean, you know, the storming of the Capitol, um, you know, taking the side of foreign dictators over the president of the United States, uh, the worship of, you know, or admiration for, you know, ex KGB <laughs> uh, officer <laughs> uh, in Vladimir Putin. Uh, it's just sort of, weird to me in a sense. And this is something I, this, this, this was not on my bingo card as they say, or say too much these days. Uh, I didn't anticipate this. Uh, but I, I do think that 
the national holiday and the proliferation of Confederate flags and that imagery and this notion of white nationalism, you know, it could produce a backlash, but, you know, we, you've got to do what you've got to do. I, I think it was the right thing to make it a national holiday. And it's an opportunity to, you know, to, for people to educate themselves about slavery and about the legacies of slavery. And there will be pushback. But everything you do that's really worthwhile, most of the things you do worthwhile create the potential for pushback. If in fact you are, if people feel threatened by it, they think that you're maybe trying to take something away from them in a way. So I, I wouldn't be surprised at all if there were not some backlash from, uh, about this. Thanks. I think we have time for one, one last question. Um, and I, I wanted to ask you about uh, a little bit more about Texas today. Um, and you write, uh, it would be almost impossible today to convey to children who live there now how different their uh, Conroe, is that how you pronounce it? Yes. It, mm -hmm. um, uh, is from the one that I knew. Um, so I don't know if you could tell all of us what Conroe is like today that is um, better uh, than it was when you were growing up, different from, um, and also where the biggest challenges are in Conroe today? Well, it's different in the sense that it was much larger. I mean, it's much, much larger. It's, it was listed as the fastest growing um, you know, town in the country. I mean, there were like yeah, maybe fewer than 5,000 people when I was growing up there. Now there's some over 80,000. I mean, has, Houston has spread out towards Conroe. Before there was basically a pine forest between Conroe and Houston. And now Conroe is more like a bedroom community to, to Houston, much more diverse than it was when I was growing up. Um, tremendous problem in some ways with drugs. And so it's made, it made crack, made community life more difficult. And then we have the issue of mass incarceration after the war on drugs, where, you know, so many people in the town were caught up in all of that. So it's not the high, it wasn't, I, I almost thought of it as an idyllic moment when I was a little kid growing up there. And I don't think it, maybe kids think of that, maybe that's just a part of being a child, but it's much more dangerous now than, than it was. I mean, we didn't lock our doors. Um, it was not, I, I never felt, felt fearful in the place, but with the advent of drugs, the bringing of drugs and so forth, that sort of changed. So that's one of the real challenges is what you're gonna do for young people, young people of, uh, of color in Conroe and, and in places like that. Can they really be incorporated into into the town in a way that gives them an alternative to that kind of thing. So that's the biggest challenge. There are now black principals <laughs> of the schools, which would have been inconceivable uh, when I was growing up, uh, you know, just much more, the, the social atmosphere is much easier now. You don't, you don't feel the sense of, of tension uh, the way you, that I felt as, as a kid because you knew that if you went into certain territory, you were in white territory. And that could, white territory was downtown. It wasn't not, not some sort of, you know, enclaves on the outskirts or whatever. And you don't really have that anymore. You know, I, I, I feel at ease. I go, to, I go to Walmart and I see white grandmothers wheeling around. They're obviously mixed race grandchildren in shopping carts, you know in the shopping cart thing, the, the seat there. And that wouldn't have happened when I was, when I was, when I was young. So people, and, and more diverse, people are able to do more of what they want to do. So with social relations are easier and that's a good thing, but they do have these other kinds of problems that they have to deal with. And you yourself have become something of a, a figure in town. I remember right, there's a bust of you and a mural of you in town. Um, Yes, yes. What, what is your relationship to the town uh, in that way? What, what, what role do you try and play in, in the town? Well, I haven't played any role in the town. This, is, this was the result of some people in the town who were very kind people in the town who wanted me to be remembered. And um, they put those things up. I went down for the bust unveiling. And uh, it was, you know, it, it's amazing to, to think 
you know, from where I came that this, that this would happen. I'm, I'm just sorry that my parents weren't alive to see it. Yeah, no, I think it's a testament to your incredible scholarship. And uh, I encourage everybody that's Zooming in to check out, to read on Juneteenth. It's a remarkable book and all of, other, uh, all of her other books, uh, they really will change your perspective on our country. Um, thank you so much, Annette, for uh, taking the time. This has been a real, uh, again, privilege and honor for me to converse with you about this book. I'm glad to be here. Thank you so much. Thanks. Goodbye. Bye.